Okay, Jonathan Jillian, uh, one last lecture today. Uh, and we got up to the election of 1988. And I told you that George H.W. George Bush, uh, the vice president of Ronald Reagan, was the odds-on favorite for the Republican nomination. The Democratic nomination went to Michael Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts. Now, the two striking things about the election of 1988, which was not close, uh, Bush was a respected vice president of a still fairly popular president leaving office, healthy economy. Uh, it, it, it was always Bush's to lose, and he didn't lose it. But he made one very serious mistake in the campaign that came back to haunt him later. He uh, would... Uh, make a promise at the Republican National Convention in Houston that summer. The promise was, he said very dramatically to the camera, straight to the camera, read my lips, no new taxes ever. Read my lips, no new taxes ever. Said just about like that. Well, this is a fatal promise to make. Now, like I said, Republicans are very anti-tax that's fair to say. Most know who likes to pay taxes, but you know Reagan had sort of ingrained into him that tax cuts are the way to go. So it wasn't controversial at the time to tell a Republican con convention that there would be no new taxes during his presidency. Unfortunately for Mr. Bush, in the middle of his presidency, we went into a recession. And when you go into recession, tax revenues fall, right? As the economy slows down, people make less money, and therefore, the taxes they send into D.C. are lower. So you have less money coming into the federal treasury in a recession. That's always the case, right? Also, though, at the same time, the number of people on unemployment that are entitled to unemployment benefits from the federal government, the number of people who are uh, uh, you know, getting other benefits from the government are definitely going to go up. The social safety net benefits uh, that, to, you know, that help those in poverty are going to go up, the expenses on those things. So just as when the recession hits, tax revenue goes down, demands on government money go up. And we also would wind up fighting a war at just about the same time. We'll get to that soon. The Gulf War of the early 1990s, uh, which also cost money. And the tax revenue was down. So during his term in office, Mr. Bush did agree to a tax cut to keep the budget deficit from spiraling out of control. It was the responsible thing to do as president. I don't think anybody could say that it was bad management of the economy, a poor job as president to agree to the taxes, but it was fatal to him politically. Read my lips, no new taxes ever, and he broke his promise. I still know people who resent George H.W. Bush for breaking that promise. Even if it was a responsible thing to do at the time, he had given what sounds like an ironclad promise that he would never raise taxes, and he did. And he would pay for it. That probably more than any other thing is the reason George Bush lost his bid for re-election in 1992. All right. Um, the other thing that happened in that, that election that left a mark on future American politics was the Willie Horton television ad. It was a campaign ad known as the Willie Horton ad. And remember that Bush's opponent, his Democratic opponent, was Michael Dukakis, the governor of Massachusetts. And while governor Dukakis had signed into law a bill that allowed prison inmates who had served a sizable portion of their sentence and who were judged to not be a risk for violent crime when they left, uh, to go into a work release program, to go out into the community and have a job. They still had to report into a probation office and all this. But the idea was we're going to integrate them back into the community so they can be productive citizens by giving them a chance to hold a job before their term of ser uh, serving in prison was 100% over. But they were supposed to be vetted to make sure they weren't dangerous. Unfortunately, one such man, Willie Horton was his name, uh, who had been released from prison, went on to 
commit two violent crimes, including murder of, a, of an innocent woman. Mr. Horton was an African-American. His victim was white. That I needed to tell you because of this advertisement. Because this was an ad run by the Bush campaign. And many people criticized it then and still hold it up as an example of what's called a dog whistle. Now I need to explain what that means. You know what a real dog whistle is. You blow it and to the human ear it makes no sound. But dogs can hear the very high pitch. And will respond to the dog whistle while other people won't hear it at all. Right? Well, a dog whistle in politics usually relates to race. And it is usually, like this ad was said to be a dog whistle ad, because on its face it seems to say nothing but simple facts. But encoded within it, many people saw a silent racist message. Okay? Now let me explain the ad to you. It was a black and white ad. And it was a voiceover with some text on the screen. But what you saw in the kind of background was a stream of people in prison uniforms going out a turnstile to the outside world. There's barbed wire on the fence, but they're going out a turnstile. They're going out into the outside world. In slow motion, they're walking out the gate. So this is bringing up the work release program in Massachusetts while Dukakis was governor. And then they showed a picture of Willie Horton, the killer. And he, he, as I recall, he had dreadlocks. You know, he looked almost like something out of Hollywood as a, a gangster, an African-American sort of drug dealing gang banger kind of person. And then they showed the innocent white woman victim and they criticized Dukakis for letting this killer out on the streets. Now, everything factually said in the ad was true. But many people said it was a dog whistle ad because of the visuals added an element of race to things like, you know, who would let this horrible man out? But of course, the horrible man's an African-American, right? You're seeing his picture uh, to prey on these innocent people. But it's a white woman, you see. So many people think that was a subtle racism in the ad. I will just tell you, it's, it was factually accurate and nobody said anything expressly racist at all. But remember, the dog whistle is not something you say out overtly that's racist. It's silently encoded in something. That's when people use the term in politics, that's a dog whistle. They mean, you know, the, uh, the normal American may not see anything in it, but the racist is going to spot it. You get it? Uh, like the dog can hear the dog whistle. <coughs> anyway, I wanted to explain that to you because if you follow politics at all, it's very possible. You could hear somebody say, well, he's trying to Willie Horton him or, you know, he's running a dog whistle ad. That's what you're talking about. Something that's not said openly, but is maybe certain kinds of people will see this message in it, maybe by design. Anyhow, I am not saying George H.W. Bush was a racist. I do not believe for a minute he was. But this ad wasn't made by him personally. I mean, campaign ads are made by staffers. And, you know, a lot of times the candidate barely even knows about it. This is one of the reasons that our campaign laws were changed so that now if you see an ad in a campaign, it'll always say, at least in writing, and often have it heard out loud, I'm Joe Smith, and I, am, I approve of this message. I'm Joe Smith, and I endorse this, mes this message. You see, Mr. Bush said, I didn't know anything about the Willie Horton ad wasn't my idea. So the laws were changed. So now the candidate has to say, I approve of this message at the end of their campaign ads, if their campaign produces it. Okay. Um, but the long and the short of it is George Bush won easily was elected president in 1988. For the first couple of years, things were going along very nicely. Um, I should point out that the Berlin Wall came down uh, during the first year of his presidency, November 1989. He had been president 10 months when the Berlin Wall came down. And Mr. Bush, who was an expert in international affairs, was a great man to be in the White House at the time. 
He uh, had a positive relationship with Gorbachev. He had met him many times when Ronald Reagan was president. And, uh, and no doubt Mr. Bush did important work behind the scenes, helping to ensure that Eastern Europe could be freed from, from the Soviet yoke. Uh, I'm sure he deserves real credit for that. Um, he helped you know, foster German unification uh, in March of 1990. All that deserves top marks for that too. Uh, he was in very many ways a highly successful international affairs president. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you the background on the Gulf War in this lecture. I'm going to run out of my 15 minutes pretty soon. But I want to give you the background because under George H.W. Bush, early in 1991, the United States went to war in Iraq in what is known as the Gulf War. Now, we fought Saddam Hussein, the dictator of Iraq, twice in an 11-year period. So, uh, you know, there are two names. The first war in 1991 is usually called the Gulf War. And the second war that began in 2002 is usually called the Iraq War. But they were both fought largely in Iraq against the same man, Saddam Hussein. There are two wars the United States fought, 11 years apart, two different names, two different President Bushes. The first Gulf War in 1991 was under President George H.W. Bush. The second war was the Iraq War in 2002. All right. Um, so, Saddam Hussein, I've already told you that he was the dictator of Iraq. Uh, there was no hint of democracy or personal freedom or liberties in Iraq under him. He ruled with an iron fist. Many people were killed. He was a brutal dictator. I also told you that we actually gave him weapons in the 1980s during the Reagan administration to fight the Iranians because we thought of the Iranians as a great threat. Unfortunately for the world, Saddam Hussein got a bee in his bonnet about Kuwait. K-U-W-A-I-T. Kuwait is a small country, emir, an emirate, a little, little independent monarchy, that is at the mouth of the Shad al Arab waterway and blocks almost all of Iraq's physical access to the Persian Gulf. I'll try to get a map for next time and show you. But it is a, a small country that separates Iraq from the Persian Gulf. And it has a lot of oil, a lot of oil. And Mr. Hussein, one night, simply sent his army charging in and grabbed the independent country of Kuwait. It was not difficult to do. Kuwait had a very small army. His army had been beefed up for the long war with Iran, which was over. And in a single morning, they had grabbed Kuwait and all its oil. And Saddam Hussein announced that he was annexing it to Iraq, making it part of Iraq as its 13th province. All that oil. And the, the royal family fled People were thrown into prison, you know, uh, Kuwaiti leaders. Um, and George Bush, our president, George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, the foreign affairs expert said, we cannot let this happen. First off, Iraq is already a major oil producer on its own. With the Kuwaiti oil fields, it will have a much bigger share of world oil production. And even more to the point, some of Saudi Arabia's richest oil fields are now a few hours tank drive away from what Saddam now claims is the new Iraqi border with Saudi Arabia. So if he decides to push on ahead, he could grab the Saudis' principal oil fields, some of them, in a matter of hours too. Because he's shown this aggressive tendency to grab oil fields, he might just keep going to Saudi Arabia. So very quickly, President Bush made the decision, as he put it when he came out to tell America and the world about it, this aggression shall not stand. This shall not stand. And he went about organizing a coalition of nations to kick Iraq out of Kuwait 
and that will be the Gulf War of 1991. Thank you. We'll continue this tomorrow.